The next speaker was recommended by Catherine. Um, it's uh, Thomas. Thomas from Switzerland. Uh, he's a publisher from Peersas Verlag. Um, he is a fan of Rudolf Steiner, so he likes this, uh, this building. He wrote a book about 9-11, and he has a European magazine, the Europea. He will talk about 9-11, but just to get in the mood and give a short overview of what happened, we have a little film. It's an old one, but I think it's still the, the best, one of the best that uh, describes the official conspiracy theory. On the morning of September 11, 2001, 19 men armed with box cutters directed by a man on dialysis in a cave fortress halfway around the world using a satellite phone and a laptop directed the most sophisticated penetration of the most heavily defended airspace in the world. Overpowering the passengers and the military combat trained pilots on four commercial aircraft before flying those planes wildly off course for over an hour without being molested by a single fighter interceptor. These 19 hijackers, devout religious fundamentalists who like to drink alcohol, snort cocaine, and live with pink-haired strippers, managed to knock down three buildings with two planes in New York. While in Washington, a pilot who couldn't handle a single-engine Cessna was able to fly a 757 in an 8,000-foot descending 270-degree corkscrew turn to come exactly level with the ground, hitting the Pentagon in the budget analyst office where DOD staffers were working on the mystery of the $2.3 trillion that Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld had announced missing from the Pentagon's coffers in a press conference the day before, on September 10th. 2001. Luckily, the news anchors knew who did it within minutes. Osama bin Laden. The pundits knew within hours. Osama bin Laden. The administration knew within the day. Terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. And the evidence literally fell into the FBI's lap. That a hijacker's passport was found blocks from the World Trade Center crash site. We can believe that. But for some reason, a bunch of crazy conspiracy theorists demanded an investigation into the greatest attack on American soil in history. That investigation was delayed, underfunded, set up to fail, a conflict of interest, and a cover-up from start to finish. It was based on testimony extracted through torture, the records of which were destroyed. It failed to mention the existence of WTC-7, Able Danger, p -Tech, Sibel Edmonds, OBL and the CIA, and the drills of hijacked aircraft being flown into buildings that were being simulated at the precise same time that those events were actually happening. It was lied to by the Pentagon, the CIA, the Bush administration, and as for Bush and Cheney, well, no one knows what they told it because they testified in secret, off the record, not under oath, and behind closed doors. It didn't bother to look at who funded the attacks because that question is ultimately of little practical significance. Still, the 9-11 Commission did brilliantly answering all of the questions the public had, except most of the victim's family members' questions, and pinned blame on all the people responsible, although no one so much as lost their job, determining the attacks were failure of imagination because... Nobody in our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes in the buildings. Except the Pentagon, FEMA, NORAD, and the NRO. The DIA destroyed 2.5 terabytes of data on Able Danger, but that's okay because it probably wasn't important. The SEC destroyed their records on the investigation into the insider trading before the attacks, but that's okay because destroying the records of the largest investigation in SEC history is just part of routine record keeping. NIST has classified the data that they used for their model of WTC-7's collapse, but that's okay because knowing how they made their model of the collapse would jeopardize public safety. The FBI has argued that all material related to their investigation of 9-11 should be kept secret from the public, but that's okay because the FBI probably has nothing to hide. This man never existed, nor is anything he had to say worthy of your attention, and if you say otherwise, you are a paranoid conspiracy theorist and deserve to be shunned by all of humanity. Likewise him, 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 and her and her, and her, and him. Osama bin Laden lived in a cave fortress in the hills of Afghanistan, but somehow got away. Then he was hiding out in Tora Bora, but somehow got away. Then he lived in Abbottabad for years, taunting the most comprehensive intelligence dragnet employing the most sophisticated technology in the history of the world for a decade, releasing video after video with complete impunity and getting younger and younger as he did so, before finally being found in a daring SEAL team raid which wasn't recorded on video, in which he didn't resist or use his wife as a human shield, and in which these crack special forces operatives panicked and killed this unarmed man, supposedly the best source of intelligence about those dastardly terrorists, on the entire planet. Then they dumped his body in the ocean before telling anyone about it. Then a couple dozen of that team's members died in a helicopter crash in Afghanistan. 
This is the story of 9-11, brought to you by the media, which told you the hard truths about... His head could be seen to move violently forward. And... They took the babies out of the incubators. And... Mobile production facilities. And... The rescue of Jessica Lynch. If you have any questions about this story, you are a batshit, paranoid, tinfoil, dog-abusing baby hater, and will be reviled by everyone. If you love your country and or freedom, happiness, rainbows, rock and roll, puppy dogs, apple pie, and your grandma, you will never ever express doubts about any part of this story to anyone. Ever. This has been a public service announcement by the friends of the FBI, CIA, NSA, BIA, SEC, NSM, White House, NIST, and the 9-11 Commission. Because ignorance is strength. <laughs> Okay, Thomas, can I invite you to uh, hold your speech? Please come on the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's a great honor to be here. I was quite surprised. And um, for the 15 minutes I have, I hope I won't uh, bore anyone because the subject now is Great by Corbett, it's a wonderful uh, way of looking at the absurdities. But of course the absurdities has a laugh laughable side, but also a very dark, serious side. And we are going to talk just a little bit of that. Now you see here a gentleman who I don't think is very m significant in itself, himself, but he was just... Um, a speaker of the official government. He was serving as a health, um, the highest health ad agent under Trump. And on 5th of April 2020, Jerome Adams made a remarkable remark. He said, the corona pandemic, so-called, is our Pearl Harbor moment and our 9-11 moment. It's like he likes it. So the corona pandemic is likened to our Pearl Harbor moment and our 9-11 moment. Only that this event the corona pandemic, uh, won't be localized and I won't, I would like that Americans understand this. Fox News, April, of five, April 5th, nine, uh, 2020. I was a bit prepared and, and um, maybe alarmed by this link of these three events because it's a linkage of deception and untruth, a perfect linkage. I was prepared by looking at, let's go, I hope it is all right. Yes. I happen to know quite a bit about Pearl Harbor long before the comparison with Pearl Harbor was thrown into the world. But there was an excellent British BBC documentary, I think in the late 80s, that made very clear that Pearl Harbor, it was called, I think in the subtitle, Bait for the War. It was very clear, all the documents they brought, that no one was surprised in the American government, in the Roosevelt government, the surprise was only for the people who are not informed. That means the mass of the Americans. It was nothing of a surprise. So the surprise attack theory is just a baloney theory, but it was brought up again and again and again, even before 9-11. Rumsfeld, I think in January 2000, 2001, went around and uh, distributed freely, without anyone asking him for this, 
a book which was written by Roberta Wohlstetter. Roberta Wohlstetter is the, the wife of um, Wohlstetter, I forgot his name, who was the Star War engineer, one of them. Her book, her book, pardon? Thank you, Albert Wallstetter. She wrote a book as an academic with the title uh, Pearl Harbor Warning and Decision. And it's all baloney, if you like. It doesn't hold the facts. In America, good historians, I forgot the names now, were already in the 30s and 40s making it very clear that the surprise attack theory doesn't hold good. Now, Rumsfeld was preparing the mood for a new Pearl Harbor-like event. Likewise, the Hollywood movie on Pearl Harbor that came out in June 2001, which is having a wonderful love story, but it mainly serves the end to make the old theory of the surprise um, solid. So, now, this made me, these events, write a little book. It's called Truth, Evil, sorry, I have to quote my own book better. <laughs> <laughs> Reality, Truth, and Evil. And the subtitle is maybe not very readable. Facts, Facts Questions, and Perspectives on 9-11. And I focused, of course, on key documents. I was very, very happy that I found um, um, an American who could see the points I tried to raise in this book, and he was a Muslim American academic, Kevin Barrett. And he made an excellent review. He even called this author um, a pupil of the mystic Rudolf Steiner. And he didn't have any problem with that. Whether Steiner is just a mystic, that's another question. But he was very benevolent, and especially he said, there are a few things you don't find anywhere, anywhere else. This is, is not an attempt of self-appraisal, but it is a fact that you don't find the document that I still found on the web page of the Pentagon. It's long ago away now about a party in Langley, Virginia, two weeks after the terrible events. Who was there? President Bush, and of course, George Tenet. And Bush, you could say, you could maybe expect they have a hard time with the CIA after this, and maybe they will dismiss a few people on the contrary, it was a happy party, and Bush says, you can read that in that document I could still find, uh, he cannot thank enough George and the CIA for their wonderful work, two weeks afterwards. So any, anyone who saw that document could know this was the contrary of pursuing justice with the CIA after this happening. Then you have seen in the film by uh, Corbett the commission report, which was by another 9-11 uh, critic uh, dubbed, called the Om Omission Report. You remember that uh, by, I forgot the writer. Thank you. Uh, again? That's right. Yeah, and rightly so, because I was also happening to have a little interview, I think it was in Vienna, with um, a man who was involved in the events. He was the, the, the guardian of the towers, and he had uh, told that he had been, uh, on this Tuesday morning, as you have heard by Catherine, on this Tuesday morning, on the, I think in the very low um, underneath um, basement, sorry. 
Not only my uh, Dutch doesn't exist, <laughs> my English is deteriorating while speaking. And he said he could clearly hear uh, explosions from there, one very far low in the basement, and the other one later, far away, up there. And then a man came, raced into this office that he had his um, uh, people talking to, and he had the flesh falling from his arm, because in the elevator there was hot fire shooting up. That's the facts he told. Then he happened to get the last people, I don't know, is it the north or the tower or the other one, out before collapse. So he was a, um, a savior of lives. And as that, he was even getting a medal by President Bush later. That's very nice, it looks nice. But they didn't even try to um, get his witness in the, for the omission, that's why it's correct, omission report. He was just not there. So, but I'm not going to um, into that too much. Then in the omission report you had also the background of um, Pearl Harbor in that sense. I forgot the name of the man who said that. Now it is not the Japanese again, now it's Al-Qaeda. That's just a switch of the brand. All the rest was the same. Now I come briefly to the story which is most sad, especially also for me as a Swiss citizen who feels very ashamed uh, about the fact that we have all these corrupt institutions from the Beats to the WHO to the Gavi in Switzerland. Very irregular, very un-Swiss. I think good Swiss citizens, and there are, were never happy and content with this fact. Now as to the WHO, there is a story which is not directly linking to 9-11, um, but indirectly, yes. When the um, Iraq war started, one of them, 90. There was a bit of difficulty to get motivation in the American public. One of the pictures you have seen in the Corbett film was of this girl who was actually used uh, in front of the um, um, Congress to make false, totally false statement about the atrocities that she allegedly had seen in Kuwait about the babies that were uh, dragged out of the computers, nothing. But the effect was quite remarkable. If you tell Americans about atrocities with babies, that obviously works, and it did work. It was an uh, emotional fueling of the totally unnecessary war against um, Iraq. Now, who was behind this action? If you look at the girl, it's quite well done. It's almost as well done as the speech of President Roosevelt after Pearl Harbor. This is something in every school it should be looked, because if you wouldn't know the background, you cannot easily say Roosevelt was telling a lie when he was speaking about the day of infamy. Great acting. I was always thinking of Shakespeare, for example, a character like um, Iago in Othello, who is the perfect intrigue-spinning character. Now, this girl was trained very well to make these false statements that emotionally help to, to um, uh, well, to oil the, the attack on Iraq. Who was behind it? Hill and Knowlton, a very old, I think it was founded in 1925 in America, 
very old um, public relations company. They were paid to train this girl who was the daughter of the ambassador in, yeah, exactly, you know the story. Now, we all know that from Wikipedia, but it's not so known, maybe it is known more and it should be known much more, that in April, no, in the May, May the 1st of um, 2000, and one, no, sorry, nonsense, two, 2020, in 2020, the WHO, the World Health Organization, has hired Hill and Knowlton, paid them, it's even uh, reported how much, in order to advise them how to sell COVID, the corona thing. That's a fact, you can see it. I haven't seen many publications who concentrated on this fact, which I think is telling. If the WHO hires a company who is behind the, um, the story that I just uh, referred to in, uh, with Kuwait, with the Kuwaiti, Kuwaiti girl, it is not very good for their prestige, if one cares about the prestige. But that's a fact. Imagine. And they gave a report in which they um, talked about many layers of influencers. That's a term that I first found there. It is still in the WHO now. I don't know whether the same origin or not. And um, who have to be addressed. Famous people, statesmen, actors, professors, intellectuals, down to very small group people. And they were giving certain recipes how to make the COVID um, thing palatable, so to speak. Now, this link alone shows that this WHO should better called a world, not health, world hell organization, <laughs> harbored in Switzerland. <clears throat> I was always thinking this little fact could help people not to lose time. We have heard how we can lose time by Catherine Austin Fitz. Um, how to lose time in analyzing long things about, for example, the WHO, if you know this fact. If you know a little bit the past of Tedros, the, the boss, also. So it's very abnormal and it's a big shame, I feel, for my own country to harbor an organization who has nothing to do with truthfulness, nothing to do with health. It's all money. <laughs> so uh, such, and I want to come to the closing saying, and this is something I haven't been able to follow up, but it would be good if some maybe free journalists I have met this interesting founder of Courier. What is the name of the... What? Yes, exactly. And maybe you could, you could investigate. Because I found out that much, um, the firm Hill & Knowlton has now um, a filiale, we say, in Germany. Yeah. Um, a very important one. Where? In Kiev, in the Ukraine. Well, that's the land where we have the great politician actor who acts all the time. I found that quite interesting. And they say it openly on the web page. Ukraine, Kiev, they don't say exactly what the services are there, but I don't think there will be much more 
uh, of a higher moral morality than the services they already did before. Now, there is something I would like to, as I have seen with great interest, some of the subjects here, I get very serious um, and I will stop in a minute. Um, that you have um, lecturers lecturing about the function of the gesunder Menschenverstand, which is a dying out property. And I wanted to, as you were hearing, I have been studying Steiner. I'm a free anthroposophy. I'm not a member of the Anthroposophical Society, but I'm very much thankful for the insights that one can get from studying Steiner's, especially also what he said about the time. Great modern things. And one thing he said in 1916, there will be from the West a law soon after 2000 which will prohibit thinking. And he added, of course, it will not be directly formulated like that, but it will have the effect that people don't want to think anymore. That's a prophecy which I think we are in its fulfillment. And for the very last little thought I want is in my book, you will find it there, is um, about evil, understanding evil. And I made an experience always talking about this subject that if you have not certain thoughts about it, namely, very simple, there is no eternal evil. Evil can be very bad and we have seen examples, Third Reich, etc. But evil is linked to time under all conditions. So if you don't understand the difference between time and eternal substance, you cannot really go well understand evil. And you are almost forced to get emotional when looking at evil, have rage and hate and so on. That doesn't help. So in order to understand the evil, and we have it on all sorts of levels today, it is good that you have an understanding what did the higher beings, if they are, the spiritual beings, think about when they permitted evil. Evil was permitted by higher powers who could as well have said, no, we spare humanity with evil. What is that? That is one of the deeper things we can find when pondering about all these catastrophes. Higher evil, higher good. There is higher good, there is absolute good, there is not absolute evil. That's a wrong thought, like thinking there is a quadrangle with three uh, points. I cannot go into that, I just wanted to touch it. And, you know, Yeah, this is just to give you an idea. We have a journal, uh, the Europea, and we have um, a journal which is in English, which is called The Present Age. So we try to do free journalism without any authority in our back. That's why I'm very happy to have been able to speak to you briefly. Thank you so much.